Então, o compêndio da Lexia Divina é uma forma simples, prática e acessível de ter na tua mão o resumo de toda a oração de um ano litúrgico. Com esse livro, você não vai perder a tua oração. Você vai registrar dia após dia o conteúdo da tua oração. E a oração vai se transformar em vida, vai se transformar em decisões, em práticas concretas. Essa palavra é tão poderosa que um só versículo pode mudar toda a sua vida. E o que é a Lexio Divina? A Lexio Divina, como o nome diz, é uma leitura orante da Palavra de Deus. Cinco passos, muito simples, e a leitura é algo objetivo. O que é que esses textos falam hoje, concretamente? Lê com calma, lê tranquilamente, lê várias vezes essas três leituras. Depois da leitura você tem a meditação. Então a meditação é um movimento de entrar dentro de nós, onde Deus habita, no mais profundo de nós, e escutar o que é que Deus quer me falar a mim, naquilo que eu vivo hoje, com essa palavra. A graça da oração. Se Deus me fala, eu respondo. Uma pessoa que ama, responde à pessoa amada. E o quarto passo, a contemplação, que transpassa o teu coração e, e torna o teu dia todo diferente. E essa palavra deve ficar ruminando no nosso coração ao longo de todo o dia. E último passo, a resolução. Qual a decisão que eu tomo face a essa palavra? Na escuta do verbo. Hello everyone, I'm Sister Mary Elizabeth from Seas of the World Community and I would like to welcome all of you there joining us this Thursday, November 4th. Today the church celebrates St. Charles Borromeo. Charles Borromeo lived during the Catholic Reformation. He was born in 1538 into an aristocratic family and as a second son was expected to serve the church. When his uncle became Pope Pius XI, Charles, only 22 years old, was created Cardinal, Archbishop of Milan, and Papal Secretary of State. Charles reside, resided in Milan until his death in 1584. As Archbishop, he chose to live an ascetic life and reform his vast diocese, imposing severe discipline on both clergy and laity, thus provoking much opposition. He, He has dedicated his, his dedicated life and tailed great personal sacrifice. He is a patron of catechists and catacombs. Saint Charles Borromeo. When we see history, we say, "Whoa! He was made an archbishop at 22." Saying, "Oh yeah, it was a thing in the family to have someone for, that belonged to the church who was a priest, who was a sister." But we can see that even with social standards, even with social uh, ways of living life, God works, God acts. And in his work, he made Charles Borromeo not someone who was only a bishop because of his family, because his uncle was a pope, but made him a saint, a saint that reformed the church, a saint that realized that Many things were wrong back then, but he was able to help others to see that and to reform our church, to make, a, to make the church be closer and closer to what God intended for his church to be. As our St. Charles Borromeo to pray for us and our families today. And for the readings of this Thursday, we will read Romans chapter 14, verses 7 to 12, Romans chapter 14, 7 to 12, Responsorial Psalm, Psalm 27, and the Gospel from St. Luke chapter 1 to 10. Let's start the reading of the Word of God. My brothers and sisters, we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to, this, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. 
Why do you pass judgment on, on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Each of us will be accountable to God. Why do you judge your brother or sister? Each of us will be accountable to God. If we truly understand that, if we truly live that, we won't be judging others and even judging ourselves because God knows us more than what we know ourselves. Paul is saying, we do not live for ourselves and we do not die for ourselves. Our lives is not ours. Why do we judge others and why do we, do we judge ourselves? We should not be judging, but live in the life the Lord has for us. As I live, says the Lord, it is true His word. His word is truth. Each of us will be accountable to God. We need to take care and to pay attention to what we will give account to the Lord when He calls us because we do not live for ourselves and we do not die for ourselves. So on the day that we die, we will die for Him because He's calling us. What will we bring to Him? What are, what are we saving here to bring it to Him? And that's why we should not be judging others because we do not know the heart of our brothers and sisters. He is the only one who knows. Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek. The Lord is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the movement of our hearts. This is what we need to do. Take courage, live in the Lord, for the Lord, wait for Him. Not be caught up in so many things outside from us, and especially someone else's life. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 10 says, All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me! For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just, just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There is joy in the presence of the angels of the Lord for one sinner who repents. 
So what's the point of being judging others, of being judging ourselves, if the joy of heaven is sinners who repent? The Pharisees were accusing Jesus that he was too nice to sinner, that he welcomed sinners. But he was just, just showing them the joy of the kingdom of heaven. To rejoice when our brothers and sisters who are far away from God come home. We as church should be happy when people who are far from come home. Should be happy, not judging, not trying to, to understand or to ask or whatever we try to do. Rejoice. Rejoice in the presence of the Lord. And rejoice within us because we are also the ones who need conversion. We are the ones who need, who need God, who need God in our lives. Not only our brothers and sisters, but each one of us. May the Lord bless us today and gives us this understanding of rejoicing of the conversion of someone or even our own conversion, because this is what the Lord God wants. Amen.